So, so I, I got a quite a bit of reading. Um, it's in your Bibles. I'm going to read it. Um, and I purposely picked a lot of scriptures to tell this story. It is the Easter story. And uh, I'm going to jump around to different versions of it uh, from the different writers. Um, primarily doing John and then Matthew, but I'm going to hint on Luke's version as well. And then we're going to try to put this together. Uh, and so please give me your time today, amen. I don't want to keep you bored or, you or nothing like that, but I want you to get something out of this word. So the word of God is coming from John chapter 19. I'm going to start at verse 26, and I'm going to read through verse 30 in the English uh, Standard Version. Um, and then I'm going to go over to Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 66. And then I'm going to jump over to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. And it's all going to make sense in the end. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 19. The Bible says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby. We starting on Friday. We're going to work our way to Sunday. All right, we, 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 on, we on Good Friday right now. We're going to work our way here to Hallelujah Sunday, all right? When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, all was now finished, all was now finished, okay? He said, to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I thirst. I thirst. A jar of full of sour wine, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to Jesus' mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished and then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit let's go to matthew chapter 27 verse 57 through 66 the bible says when it was evening there came a rich man from arimathea named joseph who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Jesus is now dead and hanging on the cross as a dead man. Joseph asked for his body. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud. And then he laid it in his own tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb. And then he went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there. And they were sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, somebody say the next day. This is talking about Saturday now. The next day after the preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. And said, sir, check this conversation out. They said, sir. We remember that imposter said, we remember how that imposter said, they're talking about Jesus. We remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, he said, after three days, I will rise. We heard him say that. They said, therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest those crazy disciples, my fault, lest his disciples go and steal him away and then tell people he has risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first Ooh, they said we got to cover this thing up we can't let him get out Pilate said to them you have a guard of soldiers go make it secure as you can so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard Ooh. let's go over to verse 28 chapter 28 chapter 28 10 verses here, here we go. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, 
who were once sitting across from the tomb, this now they're back at the tomb. They went to the tomb to see the tomb. They went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was as lightning and his clothes was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Check out verse 6, y'all. It says, he is not here, for he is, has risen, as he said he would, right? Come see the place where he lay or was lying, where he was at. Come see that place. Then go quickly, check this out, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. Verse 8, so they departed quickly from the tomb. They departed quickly from the tomb. They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Right before I give you the title, I want to say this because I, I'm, I'm cognizant of what happens every year this time of year. Every year this time of year, those deep thinkers come out of the woodwork and they try to explain that the word Easter actually comes from a pagan goddess uh, and we're celebrating a pagan goddess uh, by the name of, 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 of Estra. Estra, I got it. I got to roll that little AR. Estra, all right. And and they said we're 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 worshiping our pagan goddess of fertility. They they said, how dare you, church people, take the name Easter and use the pagan goddess's name and make that your holiday? And and then they try to trip you up. So so why do Christians use a pagan goddess for a holiday? Why do they use her name for such a holiday? And then the deep Christians say, well, I don't even call it Easter. I call it Resurrection Day, right? And and then and then let me help you out real quick, just because I, I don't. I want y'all to get into that debate. Um, I, I want y'all to understand something. If you are a true Christian, if you are a true believer, we aren't celebrating the name of the day. <clears throat> did, did, that, did that play? We, we're not celebrating the name of the day. You could call it banana day. You could call it green grass day. You could call it bugs bunny day. Because the name is not the day of the day does not matter. What we're celebrating is what happened on this day. Right? What, what we're celebrating is that empty tomb. Uh, uh, but most importantly, we're celebrating what the empty tomb means. That, that empty tomb means one thing and one thing only, that Jesus is risen from the dead. And, 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 and that means that Jesus has conquered death. Uh -huh. and, and, and that means that he has conquered death not only for himself, but also for every one of us who believes on him as the scripture has said. That means that we are celebrating our salvation. So you can call it uh, Easter, Resurrection Day, Great Getting Up Morning Day. You can call it Great Sunday or Happy Day. You can call it whatever you want to call it. I'm trying to tell you, I'm celebrating that empty tomb and that Jesus got up. So, so I'm celebrating the salvation that I not have in my life. So if you ask me a question, well, Corey, how do you know that you're saved? Here's the title of the message. I got the receipt. I got the receipt. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for how you blessed us to be here on this Resurrection Day, Easter Day, this Sunday, second Sunday in April, Lord God. I thank you. I thank you for this first Sunday after the, 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 the full moon, Lord God, that we, we pick this day. Yeah, we love you. We love you for your goodness. I thank you for everybody that has come into this building today. It's not by accident. It's not just because it's Easter. They may have thought just because, but Lord, you had a divine appointment for us to get here today. So Lord, I'm asking that you word my mouth, give me what to say, how to say, it, and when to say it. And Lord, as I always pray, don't let me waste their time. And I give you all praise, 
I give you all glory. I give you all honor. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, if you were standing, you can have your seat. Amen. I'm looking. God bless you, preacher. I see you back there. I thank God for uh, uh, Leon. So, uh, Leon, we was at the, um, well, how, many, how long ago was that? Uh, at, the, at the Secretary of State. We were uh, a couple of weeks ago, right? A couple of weeks ago. And uh, uh, Brother Harry, I went, to the, I went to the Secretary of State uh, to fix some issues regarding the titles to my vehicles. I had two new vehicles, and, and the titles were messed up. And I had to go to the Secretary of State to fix the issue for my titles, an issue that I didn't cause. Where I bought the cars, they messed up. One of them hasn't sent the title yet. And I, and, and I found out this. I didn't know this. I went to Secretary of State. They said, well, there's a, a shortage of title paper throughout the United States of America. Title paper. It's a special print paper that they printed on. They said, we have it in Michigan, but if you got a, your titles come from another state, they may not have it, and we're not sharing. They said, so you got to sit there and wait. They said, you got to wait approximately, uh, hold up to 90 days. If you don't have it by the 90th day, come back and see us. And if you come back and see us, although you've already paid for us, if you do it before the 90th day, you only had to pay $5. But if you do it on day 91, you got to pay the full $20. I said, wait a minute. So I'm within the 90 days right now. They said, yeah, but you're too close. Then that's how they said that, that, that's too short as the title paper. My other vehicle, they sent it to me, and they did not put the name of my lien holder on there. So that car was mine by title. <laughs> by title alone. But the, the credit union said, you better get our name on that thing. And you better put it on there. So, so I had to go to the Secretary of State to, to fix an issue that I didn't cause. And it cost me something. I had to pay a price to avoid being penalized by my credit union. They told me what happens is that they charge me more interest on my, my, my loan if I don't have the title correct. So I had to go to the Secretary of State and pay a price for something I did not mess up. I had, I had to pay a price for something I didn't do. <laughs> I'm just saying it cost me something to fix a problem that I never caused. It took something from me. It took my time. It took my resources. It took my mentality to get it right. I'm fixing something that I didn't break. <laughs> either way, either way, either way, I paid the price. And I left there with no titles. They said, your titles are now electronic. They said, now your, your credit union has it. So all they gave me, Doc, all they gave me was uh, a paper receipt. And the, and the Secretary of State said this, Uncle Junior, I, I paid my little cost, and they gave me this paper receipt, and they said, they said if your credit union tries to fine you for violating, uh, a violation of not having your paperwork in order, simply show them this receipt. And they will prove that this matter of concern is over. Some of y'all haven't been around me long enough. They, they said, he, the secretary, they said, they said, they can't come at you. They can't hold it against you. They can't charge you because it is finished. Y'all, y'all, y'all missing this. They said, now nah, they may talk foolish to you. They may even threaten you with a penalty, but just show them receipt. I'm preaching already. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and get into my text because, because and, and it's documented in historical records that we revere as the holy writ of God that Jesus, before he gave up the ghost and died, that he was overheard to have said, to tell us die. Hmm. To tell us die, which is, which is one word in Greek, but it's three words in English. One in three. I'm, I just thought I'd put that out there. It's one word in Greek. Three words in English. Corey, what's the three words in English? I just told y'all what it was. It is finished. Y'all going to work with me for a second. Here we go. So, so it is finished, right? Um, I think that's an interesting point. That the Greek word for it is finished is tetelestai. 
So Jesus on the cross, he said, tell us die. And then he bowed his head and he died. Okay, okay. So Jesus says, it is finished. All right? But that leads to a question, y'all. What? <laughs> what is finished? What, 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 what is actually finished? Well, to make a short of it, the Old Testament prophecies about the Deliverer and the Messiah, those are finished. Uh, the judgment of sin, that, that, that is finished. And, and now that, that judgment has been exchanged for a direct route to forgiveness of sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he was talking about when he said it is finished. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sins. That's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. So, so Jesus says, it is finished. Whew. Thank you, God. It is finished. Please follow me on this one or you'll lose it. It is finished. Say that with me. It is finished. One more time. Jesus said, it is finished. And we believe Jesus to be God manifested in the flesh. Right? Which means that he became human in order to pay for our sins. We subscribe to the belief that throughout his life, God wrapped in the flesh as we know him as Jesus, that Jesus was what? Sinless and lived perfectly which enabled him to take our sin and sacrifice himself on the cross to pay for our mistakes. Mm. So, so we also subscribe to the belief that Jesus, although he is 100% man, we also believe that he is still, in fact, 100% God, which means that when he speaks, when God speaks, he is incapable of lying. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When God says it, it's not a lie. If God said that this podium is a pink elephant with blue polka dots wearing yellow shoes, by the time the words came out of his mouth, this podium would be a pink elephant wearing blue polka dots wearing yellow shoes. It would become exactly what he said, let there be, and it was. He is incapable of lying. So, so he said, the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should Repent, right? He, hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? That's number 23, 19. That means, that means, that means if he's God and God is, if he's 100% man, 100% God, Jesus is now God here on earth. That means that Jesus is incapable of lying. Hmm? Okay, work with me a little bit. He's incapable of lying. When he said it is finished, our sin debt was paid off right then and there before he died. Did I lose some of y'all readers? When he said it is finished, our sin debt was paid off right then and there before he died. Why do I say that? It is impossible to say it is finished and be dead at the same time. Maybe that's too deep for Sunday morning, Easter. Let's just keep it on surface level. Okay, can we keep going? It's impossible to say it is finished and be dead at the same time. So Jesus stating that it is finished at the time when he said it is finished shows us that Jesus, here we go, Jesus died for sin, but he did not die with sin. That's the theological uh, uh, behind, the theology behind that statement. He died for sin, but he did not die with sin. Okay, okay, okay. You see, when he was nailed to the cross, they nailed all of our sin to the cross as well. And before he died, he made this statement, it is finished. He said, I'm through carrying the weight of sin for other people. He said, I, I'm willing to die for sin, but I will not die with sin. I'm willing to go to the grave for sin, but I will not go to the grave with sin. The Bible says, know ye that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. That's 1 John 3 and 5. There is no sin in Jesus. The Bible says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. That's 1 Peter 2, 22. I, I'm just trying to show you that when Jesus said it is finished, he meant what he said when he said it. I just think that's interesting. I just think that's very interesting that he said it when he said it. He didn't wait till he got up and say, whoo, it's finished. 
He did it before he died and said, it is finished. That's interesting, right? That's interesting. Um, um, um. But here's another interesting point. Uh, it's another interesting point I found about that word, tetelestai. Um, ancient Egyptian papyri or receipts, ancient Egyptian receipts, uh, were found to have the word tetelestai inscribed on them. Okay? Um, scholars who are m much smarter than I, I ain't going to pretend that I'm one who knows everything. I don't. I'll be learning today like y'all be learning. Hopefully. But the scholars said this. They said, um, this translation on the receipt, to Tetelestai, in this context, means paid in full. I am not suggesting that Jesus' last words on the cross was paid in full. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I'm not, not suggesting that as well. <laughs> so here's what I say about that. Knowing how scriptures often use financial terms to describe how God views our sin, such as the wages of sin, or, or, or the cost or the debt of sin is death, and then Jesus is going to teach us to pray to his Father, to God, by saying, uh, when you pray to God, ask God to what? Forgive us of our debts, our debts, our sins, as we forget our debtors, those who have sinned against us. So, so, so the possibility that Jesus is saying paid in full, it does make sense. I'm just saying, when Jesus said it is finished, it could be very well interpreted paid in full. Mm -hmm. Because the sin of this world created a debt that was owed, and the actions at the crucifixion was a transaction. The death on the cross was the payment that was made, and the empty tomb was the receipt. That means, that means it's proof that I can't be charged for a debt that has already been paid in full. I don't know about y'all, but that is praise material right there. That's, that's praise word. That, I, that my debt has been paid in full. Okay, okay, okay. Jesus says this. He said, it is finished. That's Friday. And then he bowed his head and he died. And, and the Bible says the earth shook and the rock split. Now, this is interesting to me. I, I mean, this had Bible study today. This is interesting to me because many times throughout the New Testament, when we read about earthquakes in the Bible, in the New Testament primarily, we often read about a shift in circumstances. We often read about a shift in predicaments. We often read about a shift in positions. When you read about New Testament earthquakes, it often is associated with something is changing. Hmm, okay, okay. Don't believe me? Just look at your Bibles. Every now and then you might see this. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, 52. The Bible says the earth shook and the rock split and the graves opened and the people got up. Yeah. Acts chapter 16. When, when Paul and Silas were praying and praising in prison, there was an earthquake. The doors flew open, the chains fell off, and everybody got loose. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, a great earthquake came and the sixth seal, the sixth revelation was open. Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, the, the seventh seal, the seventh revelation opened and there came a great earthquake. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, when God opened up the temple of heaven, there came a great earthquake right behind it. I'm just saying it can be argued through scripture that at times when God produces an earthquake, it's because he needs to shake something up because he's getting ready to open something up. <laughs> Do y'all hear what I'm saying? So, so now we get to Matthew chapter 28, Sunday morning. Uh huh. And, and another great earthquake happened because something was getting ready to move. Something was getting ready to open and somebody was about to get loose. Y'all missed a good praise opportunity right there. I said early Sunday morning, something was getting ready to move and something was getting ready to open and somebody was about to get loose. Now, now. Now, the exegetical part of my teaching wants me to say, maybe that's why God is allowing so many things in your life to be shaken up. Maybe there's some shaking and some moving and some shifting in your life because God is about to move something to open something that somebody's about to get loose. Did y'all miss what I was saying? I said, maybe, maybe there's some shaking and some moving and some shifting in your life because something is about to open up and somebody's about to get loose. I don't know what kind of hell you're going through, but maybe that's shaking and something's about to get loose in your life. Maybe something's falling off in your life. Hey, 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 hey. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's get through this because we got to go home and eat. 
The Bible says that there was a great earthquake in Matthew chapter 28. There was a great earthquake. And after that great earthquake, in verse 2, it says, it says, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and then sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They weren't dead, but they became like dead men. Basically saying they fainted. Ooh. These mighty men who were there to watch Jesus, when they saw the angel, ooh. Y'all know who those guards were, right? They were the same man from Matthew chapter 27 that had been assigned to watch the tomb to make sure he didn't get up. They were there because Jesus had been, they had heard Jesus saying that he was getting up on the third day. It had been overheard, and, and they called him an imposter. He said he's going to get up on the third day. So they sent them to watch there. They watched the tomb to make sure, first of all, that the disciples didn't steal him and then say he rose from the dead. And then secondly, if he did get up, they were there, uh, 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 if he did get up on his own, they were going to block that. They were going to make sure that story never got told. Did you hear what I'm saying? They, they, first of all, we're going to make sure them disciples didn't steal him. But secondly, if he, that dude do get up, ain't nobody going to, he going to go back down. <laughs> this story ain't going to never be told. Mm -hmm. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Maybe the people who are trying to block you are trying to block you because they secretly believe in you. Uh -huh. Did you hear what I said, Doc? Maybe they believe in you so much, they're going to try to block you. Okay, okay. Maybe those schemers who are trying to hinder your progress really believe that you're going to do what you said that you're going to do. Maybe they believe that, that you're going to become what you dreamed that you would become. Come on. Maybe they believe that you're going to go to the height that they imagined that you would get to. Hear me, hear me. Maybe the haters' actions against you should be a confirmation by you. Elder Tim, does that make sense? If they keep on working against me in this area, maybe that's where I'm supposed to be at. Hey, hey, hey. So maybe your, what you're doing against me should let me know God really want me. I'm just saying, take note, y'all. Take note of this story. Early in chapter 28 of Matthew, the soldiers, catch this, the soldiers are the only one exhibiting any type of belief that the resurrection could actually happen. Mm -hmm. They're the only ones on the scene that believe this might take place today. Okay, okay. You don't see his trusted disciples uh -uh. early on in the resurrection story. Why? Because when Jesus was apprehended a couple of days ago, the Bible says that they all forsook him and fled. Don't believe it? That's Mark chapter 14, verse 15. It said they all forsook him and fled. That means his own disciples abandoned him because they didn't believe in him. Are you hearing what I'm saying? His own disciples abandoned him because they didn't believe him. And, and then, and then, and then, somebody say, and then. And then, yeah, we got these women who showed up to the, to, to the tomb with their spices and their ointment to anoint. Oh, the tomb. They were actually there to embalm Jesus. That's what they were there for. They are there to embalm Jesus. You done embalm live folk. So that means they expected him to be dead. And they, catch this, they were there to keep him dead. Did that, that go too far? If I'm there to embalm you, I want to preserve you as you are. Okay, okay. So the disciples didn't believe in him. And these women, they, they want to keep him dead. The disciples didn't believe he was getting up. And the, the, the women wanted, wanted to keep him dead. And, and then you have these soldiers who are there because they heard Jesus say that he's coming back on the third day. So they're there because they don't want to see him alive. One group of people don't believe he's going to get up. Another people, group of people said, we're going to make sure that you stay down. And this last group of the people, the disciples, said, we don't want to see you get up. Did you hear what I just said? 
They, they, they are there because they don't want to see him alive. So Jesus is in, he is such a threat to them, right? He's such a threat to those soldiers that they're willing to sit there and watch him while he's dead. Yeah. Jesus is such a threat to them alive that they're willing to sit there and watch him while he's dead. Now, now, I know we often try to put ourselves in a situation how we would handle stuff. And I don't know about you, but I, I know, knowing what I know now. See, I wasn't there back then, but knowing what I know now, with the knowledge I have now, if I'd have known this was taking place and me have been done, uh, have walked with him and I've talked with him and I've communed with him, if I had have been there and Jesus told me, hey, I'm getting up on the third day, I would have been sitting outside that tomb uh, with a, a lawn chair, a cooling fan, a bag of popcorn, just waiting for Jesus to do exactly what he said he's going to do. What's going on? He said he's getting up. I done seen him raise the other people from the dead. I have no reason to doubt what he said, so. Hey, hey, when you come, bring some wings. I, I, I'm expecting him to do what he said he's going to do. But the Bible says that when these women showed up, they looking for a dead Jesus. And they met an angel who said, do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. Mm -hmm. They said, he is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where he was. They come looking for a dead Jesus, and the angel said, I know what you're looking for. But you need to come see where he was, because he's not here no more. He got up. He got up, just like he said he would. He got up. Come and see the place where he was. <laughs> Luke chapter 24, verse 4 says, as to this verse of story, it said that when they heard that, the women were greatly perplexed about this. They were confused. What do you mean he got up? What do you mean he's not in there? It said they were greatly perplexed. Luke chapter 24, verse 4. They were greatly perplexed about this, which proves that they, even the further, that they didn't expect to see a risen, risen Jesus. Amen. You know why? Because in their minds, Jesus was supposed to be dead. Are you seeing what I'm saying? In their mind, Jesus was supposed to be dead, but, but when they looked, they didn't see a dead Jesus. Girl, did you, girl, what happened? Yeah, what, what, what happened was, um, this is where they put him. Remember, we were sitting there across from the tomb when they put him in there and sealed the tomb. And then them soldiers came and put their seal on it to make sure nobody went in there. But now, they're trying to tell me he's not in there. Yeah. You, you going to go look? <laughs> First of all, who is this dude talking to? Get, get down and look. Let me borrow your lighter. <laughs> what do you see when there's nothing there to see? What we see as believers, we see the power of the resurrection. The angel said in Luke, he said, he said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Mm. Ooh. We almost there, Rex. So, so I'm glad that the women were quick studies. I, I'm so glad women were quick, quick studies because men have been trying to fool around like, well, somebody must have took him then, something, something. This, 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 is, this is the stone right here. You can't just move that. 
This is, this is that good stuff right here. This that, look at that. That's that good stuff. And he done got out. But I'm glad they were quick studies because they didn't waste any more time. He not in here. They didn't waste no time looking. No further. Once they saw he wasn't where he was supposed to be, they didn't waste no more time. You see, once the angel reminded them of what Jesus had said about his own resurrection, they weren't perplexed anymore. They weren't apprehensive anymore. They weren't scared anymore. No, they were joyful because they absolutely knew that the empty tomb meant and they ran out to go share the good news. Come on. Come on. They ran out to go share the good news that he is risen. The Bible says that. So they departed quickly from the tomb. That's what the Bible said. They departed quickly from the tomb. That means that they left the tomb behind. I got to do it this side. They, they said they left quickly from the tomb, which means that they left the tomb behind. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? They left the tomb. They quickly left the tomb behind. <laughs> okay, okay. I got to throw in one of my stories. Here we go. Uh, have you ever been to a restaurant where you are waited upon? Fine dining. You sit down at the restaurant and you eat your food and you enjoy whatever they give you to eat. Well, when you're done eating, they bring the bill to your table. Right? And they present it to you. And, and if you're smart or if you got a credit card, you pull out your credit card, you give it to them, and they take that bill and your credit card away. Y'all done that before? And, and then, if your credit card actually got some credit on it, they return to your table with your credit card, catch this, and two receipts. Okay. My wife said it. One for you and one for the restaurant. Okay, okay. Your copy shows what was paid for. Their copy shows how it was paid for. <laughs> this, this is good stuff right here. This is good stuff. Let me say it again. Your copy shows what was paid for. The restaurant copy shows how it was paid for. Maybe I lost y'all on that one. Your copy shows what was paid for. We call it the Holy Bible. The restaurant's copy show how it was paid for. That's the power of the resurrection. But if you pay attention, the transaction's not done there. They give you two copies to your table. It requires for you to leave your mark on the restaurant's copy. Yeah, yeah. Do I got any witnesses in the house? They say, can you just sign your name here? And if you want to leave a tip, you put your tip on there too. And, and you sign that copy. And then what you do? Girl, you leave that copy behind. And you leave it right there where you signed it. I'm just saying, when the women saw the empty tomb and saw that it was signed, sealed, and delivered, they quickly left it behind. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I, I, I'm trying to tell you, the Bible says that the angel told them, go quickly and tell. Somebody say, and tell. Go quickly and tell. Somebody say, and tell. And tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. You don't leave a good restaurant and go tell people how good that receipt looked. Ooh, they had some good paper that receipt was on. Ooh Nobody leaves the restaurant talking about how good the receipt looked. But your copy said, the receipt paid for this, it paid for that, it paid for this, and that and another. You don't tell nobody about the receipt, but you tell them about the goodness. Oh, come on. Because the receipt is just proof that the transaction is complete. Hmm. The receipt is just validation that the price has been paid. Do you hear what I'm saying? They didn't run to tell people to go look at the empty tomb. Mm -mm. They ran to tell others the good news that Jesus is risen. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. They quickly ran down to go tell the people that Jesus, he got up. I almost forgot, but he got up. I went there looking for a dead Jesus, but he got up. <laughs> The Bible says 
they departed quickly from the empty tomb. Why? Because they got the receipt. Mm -hmm. Y'all missed that one. They got the receipt. Somebody said, I got the receipt. I got the receipt. Uh -huh. I got the receipt. And the receipt says uh, that his resurrection from the dead makes it possible for us to be forgiven of our sins. The receipt says that Satan didn't win. The receipt says that Jesus is alive and well. The receipt says his victory is our victory. The receipt says he's conquered sin and death once and for all. The receipt says because he lives, we can live. The receipt says by his stripes, I am healed. The receipt says I have power to cancel the hold that my past, my failures, my mistakes, my sins, my regrets have over me. The receipt says there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. The receipt says I can forget those things which are behind me. The receipt says I can press for those things which are before me. The receipt says he's alive. And here's the best thing, y'all. Here's the best thing. The receipt says that where sin has separated us from God, God saw the completed transaction. And now when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And we are considered righteous and forgiven. Let, let me prove it to you. I'm going to give a word to you. Romans chapter 4, verse 21 through 25. Romans chapter 4, verse 21 through 25. I'm going to read it out of the com uh, contemporary English version. It says, Abraham was certain that God could do what he had promised. Mm -hmm. So God accepted him, right? Just as we read in the scriptures. Catch this though. But these words were not written only for Abraham. Mm. They were written for who? Us. They were written for who? Us. They were written for who? Us. Since we will be accepted because of our faith in God who raised our Lord Jesus to life. Come on, one more. Come on. God gave Jesus to die for our sins and he raised him to life so that we will be made acceptable to God. Tell somebody, I got the receipt. Y'all didn't say it right. Say, I got the receipt. Tell somebody, I got the receipt. Say it one more time, I got the receipt. And the receipt says, oh, y'all not talking no more. Say, and the receipt says, talk with me, say, I got the receipt. Say it again, say, I got the receipt. And the receipt says, and the receipt says, paid in full. Say it again, say, paid in full. One more time, say, paid in full. Fools, give God a praise in this house of God. Come on, I got the receipt. I, I got the receipt. It's the holy word of God. I got the receipt. And it says paid in full. The Bible says that they departed quickly from the empty tomb. That means that they didn't dwell at the empty tomb. But they ran to spread the word that he is risen amen amen stand to your feet how many of you got your Bibles with you here at church today if you got a Bible just wave a Bible in there so I got the receipt and my receipt says paid in full <laughs> listen if you're willing to accept what Jesus did for you and repent of your sins and confess that Jesus is Lord and you accept him into your heart, listen, you can live an empowered life. And, 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 and I know, I know, because I've been there what I'm about to say and I know I'm telling the truth. Some of you are hesitant to turn your life over to God because you have too much other stuff on your heart. But you need to do like Jesus did to that tomb. You need to empty yourself of all those things. Empty yourself of the worry. Empty yourself of anxiety. Empty yourself of concern and frustrations and, and bitterness and all those things that come from your carnal flesh. And when you do that, you'll find that when you empty yourself of all that garbage, you'll find that you have room for God inside. Mm. Hear me. To be emptied of those things of this world and to be filled with the presence of God is a critical aspect of your Christian life. So my question is very simple today. Will you 
accept Jesus into your life. I don't know what the misconception about Jesus is. I know how, I know how we grew up and, and saved people weren't the most attractive lifestyle that I want to live. They don't have no fun. They dry. They don't go to the movies. The women's skirts got to be under the heels. The men got to have neckties on. I heard a preacher preach at our church where he said, you got to have long sleeves on to be saved. Y'all remember that guy? He said, you got to have, he said, if you ain't, if you got your sleeves rolled up, he said, he said this, he said this. He said, he don't even show his arms to his wife. I said, man, you got problems. <laughs> he made being holy so difficult. It, it's difficult. I see stuff online, I laugh. I laugh at stuff that I can't even post. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that is that real? Or oh, y'all haven't been in your house and laughed at some stuff like? Hey, 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 Holmes. If it's funny, it's funny. It don't make it right, but it's funny. It's funny. But I'm trying to tell you, as a, as a saved human being, all you gotta do is turn your life over to God and do the best that you can. Do the best that you can, baby. So if you want to accept him, all you got to do is repeat after me, and you have to meet it in your heart. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You have to meet it in your heart. I can't make you be saved. I can't slap you in the head with anointing oil and kick you in the behind and hit you with a Bible and make you saved. I might make you mad. Uncle G, you said just pray for him, right? That's all I can do is pray for him. But I'm going to have you pray for yourself right now. Say this. Say, Father, forgive me. For I have sinned. I need to be saved. Save me. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. I believe in my heart that he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe in my life that he got up with all power in his hand on the third day and this day I celebrate his resurrection and because he got up I got up because he rose I rose and because he lives I live and for that reason today April 9th 2023 I decree and I declare that I Say your name. Say your name, Corey. Say, I, Corey, I am saved. Say it again. Say, I am saved. Say it one more time. Say, I am saved. I'm going to mess with somebody real quick. But do you have any money in your pocket at all? At all? None. And you got money in your pocket. Anybody got money in their pocket at all? I'm not going to take your money. You got money in your pocket right now. And you know you got that money in your pocket. You know it right now. Well, I'm looking. You got it. It's yours, right? It's yours. Can I stand here and convince you that you don't have that money in your pocket? Can I stand here right now and say, bro, you don't have what you think you got in your pocket? Can I convince you otherwise? Why? Because you know you got it. What I'm using the example for is that if you got saved today, can't no devil in hell convince you that you can get saved today. I got it with me, and when I leave here, I'm taking it with me. Don't y'all leave that salvation in these chairs. Uncle Junior got many years of salvation. He don't need no more salvation like y'all need. You take that salvation with you. You take it in your car. When you're looking at your spouse or your mate that you sit next to and you want to go off, take your salvation with you. When you get home, if they didn't come with you and you expect something to be done that's not done, keep your salvation with you. When you go to work tomorrow and they act just as crazy as they always do and you still keep showing up, take your salvation with you. 
Y'all know y'all be like, if they say one more thing to me, I'm going to lose it. One more. How many one more did you give them? So the same way you value that paycheck, value your salvation. And more. Because dad says, hell is too long and too hot. For me to put my religion up on a shelf to satisfy this flesh. But tell like three people that I'm saved. I got saved today. Tell three people I got saved. I got saved today. Tell them I got saved today. I, I got saved today. And if you don't believe me, tell them I got the receipt. I, I got the receipt. I got the receipt. Give God a praise this room, everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.